Hello everyone and welcome to a general guide to SOX lead extraction. Today we'll be talking about many of the things that go into SOX lead extraction such as understanding the theory behind how to operate a SOX lead, the history of the machine, some operational parameters and parts that are of importance, applications, and finally we'll look at solvents that are used in the extraction of various biological samples using Soxlet extractors. So let's get started. Overall, the history of the Soxlet is pretty simple. It was developed by its namesake, uh, Franz von Soxlet, a German chemist, um, and he developed that in 1879. He was an agrochemist, um, he foc and his focus was primarily on uh, proteins and sugars in milk. And so he had developed this Soxlet as a way to study the fats in milk, uh, similarly to uh, Pasteur. And he had also proposed uh, the, pasteuriz uh, the pasteurization process, uh, although it wasn't known by that until later on, but he had also... Uh, thought that it would be best to tr um, heat treat milk uh, to get rid of bacteria as well. And so the Soxlet was brought about and it's still used today in this fashion to extract lipids from a solid sample. Primarily that's a biological sample, but it's not limited to biological samples. It can also be uh, an inorganic material that has... Uh, components that are selectively soluble in some sort of that, um, solvent excuse me, that you're using. So now let's take a look at the parts and the operation of the Soxlet. So uh, as you can see, the, the image on the right is the three major components of a Soxlet apparatus. Um, it, ha it contains a boiling flask with ex uh, the extraction solvent. It contains the Soxlet in the middle and it contains a reflux condenser on top. And so what you can see in the, in the red on the bottom is the boiling flask is filled with a solvent of interest. Heat is applied. The solvent is then evaporated into the Soxlet. And then th the um, solvent that is evaporating continues up into the reflux condenser where it uh, refluxes down into the Soxlet um, where your sample is. And we'll talk a little bit more about operation in the, ne in the next segment. Um, the Soxlet itself, the purple uh, circle, has uh, three main parts. That's a percolator, uh, the thimble where you have put your sample, and then you have a siphon. And so those are uh, aptly labeled there, the, the first one being the percolator, the second one being the thimble, and the third one being the siphon. And the uh, green in that image is representing the biological sample. And so additionally, heat is supplied via a heating mantle on the bottom of the boiling flask to ensure uh, continuous evaporation, continuous heat. So now let's just quickly look at uh, how it's run and the principle governing the extraction. So the, the main principle is that hot fresh solvent percolates over a solid sample and this um, allows the extraction of lipids um, and so uh, just a quick schematic showing this, the heat is applied uh, to the boiling flask. The gray line indicates the evaporation of the solvent, which goes up into the reflux condenser. That then condenses, drops down via the red arrow into the thimble, which is the, the green thing. This, that's where the sample is. And then what happens is once that fills up, so when the uh, percolator uh, fills up with uh, condensed solvent, up to the siphon line, so above that siphon, which is that little green arm in the image, it then siphons back into the round bottom boiling flask. And so this is the driving force behind this, the uh, sock slip because once it refluxes into the boiling flask, it is then evaporated again, and the evaporation only evaporates fresh solvent. So all the extractables, the lipids, remain in the flask while fresh solvent travels up and down again extracting more and so this is what dr is the driving force behind this extraction method. So let's quickly take a look at applications of the Soxlet. So uh, the extractors are um, very advantageous in, in a number of settings and that's because they one are autonomous and two they recycle solvent and three they are scalable 
and four, they are easily varied uh, in their operating parameters. So for the first one, the um, the nice thing about a succlet is you can start it, set a timer, come back, and the the reaction the extraction will be complete. So that is very attractive, as opposed to other methods where you have to uh, you know extract lipids continuously. The second is the recycle solvent, so you use a fixed volume of solvent that you can actually then recover using a rotary evaporator later on, so that's very attractive. The third one, uh, they're so scalable, um, you can, there are various sizes of socks that go up very, very high. Of course, when you get to very large volumes, uh, it gets a little more complex, but nonetheless, it can be done. And four, you can easily vary operating parameters. This is, uh, I've highlighted research here because it's a key component in any research investigation where you want to, uh, you know, examine the effect of increasing the amount of sample you're extracting, you increase the amount of solvent relative to the, the amount of sample, change the heat, vary the uh, condenser temperature, so all things that are easily changeable uh, within the setup. And so there are many uses for succulent extractions. The first one, main one, is biofuel production. Lipids are the main component in biofuels. Second is essential oils and fragrances. Um, and lastly, the... Um, for any laboratory, uh, be it a biochemical lab, an organic lab, it's also useful. Uh, and so I've uh, starred environmental analysis because this is something that I think is quite fascinating. Uh, you can use Soxlet in um, analyzing environmental samples, be it soil, seawater, uh, uh, marine species, stuff like that. And uh, the, the content of the fat in, in, in a biological sample, especially uh, an environmental sample, it can tell a lot about the environment. That's something that I'm particularly interested in, so that's just why I started that there. So next, let's take a look at the um, extractables. So this is a, a term that is uh, given to the what we're extracting. They call it extractables. So uh, there are lots of different classes of what we extract. So the, the first one is neutral lipids. So neutral meaning it's not charged, so that would be either free fatty acids or uh, tags being tri triacyl glycerides, and here's a picture of a, a tag right there for reference. Um, and you can see we have the glycerol head group, and then we have three long chain esters there. Secondly, we have polar lipids that we're extracting. So that's generally fatty acids uh, plus a polar head group. So here's a phosphatidylcholine, which is uh, a classic uh, polar lipid. We can also have uh, a glucose group on the front there, we can have a sphinco group on the front there, so a variety of, of head groups we can have on polar lipids, and of course the head group is what changes the polarity of the lipid. And lastly, this is quite funny, but the other classes, uh, other, that's what uh, researchers call it, this can be any other component that is lipid-based or doesn't generally fall under a lipid category, so lipoprotein, steroids, cellular debris can also be extracted. Uh, an interesting one that I've put there, an example, is chlorophyll A, which is uh, a pigment molecule in plants and algae, and um, of course when you run extractions on those biological samples, plants, your extractables are generally green, and the reason they're green is because you're extracting chlorophyll in the samples. Uh, so now let's talk quickly about solvent choice. And the reason solvent choice is important is because it has implications uh, for what classes of extractables you'll be e extracting. And so there's a variety of solvents that can be used in succulent extraction. Here are three examples. Um, we have N-hexane, ethyl acetate, and ethanol. And of course, these are of different polarities, and we can vary the mixtures, the ratios of solvents. And like I said before, this will have implications regarding the content of the extractables that we were recovering. And what I mean by that is, if we use, uh, I'll just provide an example below, let's say we use, we're using pure hexane versus pure ethanol. So hexane is very nonpolar, uh, so it will mainly, uh, you know, preferentially target uh, neutral lipids because it's very hydrophobic, uh, but ethanol is polar. It's got a hydroxyl head group, so it's uh, stronger, meaning it can extract neutral lipids and polar lipids. And the reason I can say I say it also extracts neutral lipids is because it has a two-carbon tail, 
and that can um, that has slight hydrophobic character, and that can extract neutral lipids as well. But the hydroxyl group helps it extract polar lipids, and the hydroxyl group, interestingly, also helps it permeate the cell wall. So that's why we say ethanol is stronger, because it can, if we have a biological sample, ethanol can uh, has better access to the cellular lipids than hexane does, because hexane fears water. Hexane does, is not miscible with water, so it's actually repulsed by water, so it can't extract as much. Uh, and so lastly, just some con uh, general considerations about uh, the solvents. Um, so by this information, you might think ethanol is the better solvent choice, right? Well, it actually depends because when we, when we, talk, we need to think about the big picture here. And uh, as an engineer, that's something that I do constantly. So thinking about life cycle on the small scale, it doesn't really matter what solvent we're using. Um, but on an industrial scale, the solvent that we use does matter a lot because of costs, and we have to recover the solvent to make the operation economically feasible. We can't just expand as much solvent as we want. And so, interestingly, um, hexane is not miscible with water, and so this, but ethanol is, and so this makes hexane more attractive on the industrial scale. And the reason why is right there. It's because if we want to recover ethanol, from the uh, extractables, we have to distill. Um, we have to distill it. So, if your biological sample has any water in it, or any water is used in the process, when we recover it via a um, you know a variety of ways, our ethanol is no longer going to be anhydrous. No longer going to be 100%. It's going to have water in it. And in order to and the way we recover the water is via, uh, via distillation. That's the only way we can do it. And distillation requires a lot of energy and a lot of equipment. But hexane, how, however, hexane is not miscible with water, so we can just put it in a separatory funnel, and we'll get two phases, an organic and an aqueous, and we can easily decant the uh, organic phase and recover the hexane. So on a larger scale, it might be more beneficial to use hexane because it's easier to recover, although it may be extracting less because it's not as, quote-unquote, strong as, as ethanol. So thanks for watching. I hope that uh, this information was helpful to you, give you a general idea of Soxlet extractions. And now I'll say go run a Soxlet yourself because the best way to learn about these fundamental processes is to go run them yourself. So see if you can contact the lab or, or at your university or school, go uh, run a Soxlet and see what it is for yourself. Thanks again.